Hello everyone and welcome. Are you worried about a data breach? My name is Linda Williams. I am a community outreach and training manager with Consumer Action. We are an advocacy and educational organization. Today we've teamed with Privacy Rights Clearinghouse to bring you this segment on data breaches and how you can use a new tool created by PRC to track data breaches. Now, if you're saying, mm, Linda, why in the world will I want to track data breaches? The simple answer is to protect yourself. As you will hear from our speaker today, a data breach is an incident where information is stolen or taken from a system without the knowledge or authorization of the system owner. Now, the stolen data could include sensitive information about the company, but it could also include customer data. So if you're dealing with a company that has been breached, let's say Home Depot, Facebook, Microsoft, LinkedIn, or Marriott Hotels, your personal information may have been compromised. And the theft of personal identifiable information can lead to identity theft. So let's turn to our guest speaker to learn more about this new uh, data uh, breach tracking tool. Our guest speaker is Emery Rowan. He is a policy counsel at Privacy Rights Clearinghouse. And Privacy Rights Clearinghouse has been a friend of consumer action for years. Well, Emery is a co host of two tech law policy podcasts and sought out the speaker for events globally. He evangelizes the need for more privacy protection. Analyzing legislation, rules, and existing laws, he formulates and articulates privacy rights, clearing house advocacy positions while representing PRC to organizations, lawmakers, government agencies, coalitions, and the public. Welcome, Emory. It is indeed an honor to have you with us today. I'm anxious and I'm sure our audience is. So can you please tell us a little bit about this new tool that Privacy Rights uh, Clearinghouse has created and why should we be using it? I would love to, Linda. Thank you so much for what a uh, for such a warm introduction. Uh, that is uh, too kind, truly. Uh, and I definitely need to update that bio because, unfortunately, those tech law podcasts have uh, fallen to the wayside. At least uh, my involvement, though. You might want to check out Tech Policy Grind. I believe that there is still ongoing with a new class of Internet Law and Policy uh, Foundry Fellows. But yes, I am thrilled to be here today to talk about our data breach chronology. Um, it is a tool that we've been developing at Privacy Rights Clearinghouse since, well, practically since the very first data breach notification law was passed way back in 2005 in California with uh, no small part to uh, due to our own advocacy involvement uh, with our original executive director, Beth Givens, being heavily involved with the passage of that uh, landmark piece of legislation that has now been essentially imported or modified in some way and imported into every other state in the country. So a little bit about PRC. Uh, we have been fast friends with Consumer Action for a long time, but I'm going to fly through this. Our mission statement is that we protect privacy for all by empowering individuals with education and advocating for positive change. So we are also an ed education and advocacy organization focused on consumer privacy. Established in 1992, based in San Diego, California, our issue areas are uh, predominantly in California, uh, but uh, historically have focused uh, really sort of laser targeted on consumer privacy. These issues include uh, identity theft, data breaches, privacy rights around consumer privacy laws like the California Consumer Privacy Act, uh, data brokers, uh, and we have a whole host of educational materials that break down existing privacy rights on our website at privacyrights.org. You'll also find our brand new data breach chronology at privacy, privacyrights.org slash data hyphen breaches. We're also on LinkedIn, Mastodon, and Twitter, uh, while Twitter is still around. So let's talk a little bit about data breaches. I think Linda did a wonderful introduction about uh, data breaches, uh, the, the broad strokes. Um, and indeed, data breaches are an inadvertent exposure of a business's uh, information that they have on, uh, and that can be in a hack that can be in an unintentional disclosure. Um, it could be that the employee opened up a piece of ransomware that 
extracted all of their information, or it might just be that an employee left a unsecured laptop in their in their car, and that car was broken into. Or this happens very frequently: uh, is a filing cabinet is left out by the dump, uh, which happens to have a whole host of health information. Tracking data breaches, though, is an incredibly difficult challenge. I mentioned earlier that we have. 50 individual data breach notification statutes now, all of them in some way built off of California's model, but it has taken quite some time for the rest of the country to, to catch up to California. In fact, it took until 2018 for the 50th state data breach notification law to get passed, but that leaves us now without a single federal data breach notification standard, meaning that when a business is breached, there are 50 different breach notification laws that they have to comply with or uh, should comply with, I should say. And of those data breach, of those 50 state laws, only a subset of those actually require that the breached business notify not just an individual that was impacted, but an attorney general's office or a government agency. Of those that require notification to a government agency, only a subset of those share that information publicly on our website. So as we've tried to track data breaches throughout the history of this program, it has really grown organically. Originally, it was really nothing more than a blog post. When we would see a news article talking about the latest terrible data breach, we would write up a quick blog post about the thing and, uh, and catalog it. Over time, that eventually changed to a database. Uh, but eventually, it became very clear that Keeping up with the flood of data breaches is, is like trying to drink from a fire hose. There are simply an inordinate amount of data breaches uh, coming down the pipe and relying on journalists or news articles to give the information about data breaches is also problematic because when a news article breaks about a breach, it might not have all of their information. What's more, uh, if we report that information based on a journalist's uh, reporting of a data breach and then that information changes, well, we've had some businesses contact us very angrily down the line, uh, telling us that we have uh, been improperly telling the world that they have been breached. So our approach since, uh, well, for the past six years or so has been shifting the information that we've been pulling into the data breach chronology to official government sources. So our data breach chronology, we're very proud to say, is based entirely on data breach notifications that have been sent and then subsequently shared by various state agencies around the country. And what I want to underline here is the fact that data breaches are, well, privacy, consumer privacy especially, but data breaches are an intersectional issue. Uh, data breaches often disproportionately affect already disadvantaged communities, including low-income groups, minorities, and the elderly. We, Linda mentioned earlier that identity theft is one of the sort of most recognizable harms from a data breach, uh, but this can also lead to financial stress, uh, financial loss or emotional distress, and it can exacerbate existing inequalities. Non-native English speakers or uh, communities may be more vulnerable to data breaches also due to the lack of digital literacy or resources to safeguard their information. So we built this tool, the data breach chronology, fundamentally as a tool for consumers and a tool for civil society. Our goal is to help uh, advocates, policymakers, journalists, researchers, and community organizers better understand this data breach landscape. There are well, on our, by our count, um, more than, 50, well, nearly 20,000 individual data breaches that we've tracked on our data breach chronology, impacting billions of impacted records. And so uh, it is a frankly insurmountable task to try to just take the raw data and look at that sort of flood, you know, just the, the list of data breaches as they come and try to extract anything relevant. So we spent a lot of time and effort trying to develop interactive dashboards using uh, Tableau, a sort of robust, flexible platform that allows us to continue to build on it, to improve on it, uh, and to uh, display our data breach data in ways that is accessible and provides both at a glance and in the weeds insights. Our goal here is to provide a tool that you will want to use and that you can use to get in-depth insights and the insights that you need that impact your community. But it is, of course, uh, we want to underline that 
Uh, 85% of adults have smartphones with lower income, black and Hispanic communities being more likely to be smartphone dependent. It was always clear to us from the outset that we would need to make this cross-platform and accessible to as many people as possible. And so that is another reason why we use Tableau as the sort of foundation of our uh, data breach chronology dashboard. This should work on everything. Apple, Android, Mac, Windows, Linux, smart TV, smart refrigerator. Um, actually, if you do have a smart refrigerator, I would love for you to take a picture of you pulling up the data breach chronology and send it to us. Uh, we're, we're always trying to improve the experience on every platform that we can. So what I'd like to do is just go through some of the various views that you can see with our da data breach dashboard and talk about what you can do with this tool and how each, uh, how each sort of uh, view functions. As you can see, there are four different primary tabs in our data breach chronology. Uh, and by the way, if you go to our data breach chronology at privacyrights.org slash data hyphen breaches, and it doesn't look correct on the first view, uh, try reloading the page or reload the page a few times. <laughs> uh, there's a slight, a slight rendering bug that uh, might appear to cut off the chronology, uh, but you either viewing it in full screen or reloading the page several times should nip that problem in the bud. But let's look at the key insights timeline. This is the view that is present when you first load up the chronology. The goal here is to help you understand broad trends over time. We have a slider that allows you to select a date range or a specific year to get insights into data breach impact on that very year. As you can see, if the full slider is selected, we have nearly 2 billion impacted records across 20,000 reported breaches. But it is important to note that one of the shortcomings of our current chronology is that we do not do duplicate detection. So we want to make very clear that what we're saying, showing here is not an exhaustive list, is, well, two things really, it's, it is neither an exhaustive list of every single data breach that has been, uh, that has occurred in the United States, nor is it a uh, exhaustive list of the data breaches uh, tri like curated by duplicates. In other words, you will very likely uh, see duplicate data breaches when a business has reported a breach to multiple states because uh, they are complying with multiple state reporting obligations. That being said, uh, the numbers are certainly going up each year. <laughs> uh, 20,000 is a very big number, and we are working on uh, duplicate detection and uh, in, in improving these features in the future. Fundamentally, though, our breach chronology displays the breaches that have been reported. This is a chronology of data breach notifications because, unfortunately, it's the best glimpse, it's the best window we have into the true data breach landscape, but it is and will be incomplete. Moving on to the next view. Oh, actually, a bit about our labels. You probably saw uh, the table here has uh, on the key insights view two tabs that you can select type of data breach and type of organization, which live update based on the date range that you selected, displaying the breaches as they have occurred across uh, different uh, organization types and across different types of breaches. So here on screen right now, you can see that on the type of breach, we have multiple different labels, including card, disk, hack, inst, fizz, port, stirp, and unknown. Uh, we also have type of organization labels that are similarly um, obfuscated. So I want to quickly jump in and give a bit about our labels and also apologize for the one sort of wall of text slide in this presentation. Uh, but the information is always available on our FAQ beneath the uh, chronology. Uh, and you can certainly pause the video and read this if you like. But our database and our labels have evolved over time with the current selection of breach types and organization types having been arrived at during our last renovation of the data breach chronology around 2012, when we worked with a data scientist to uh, really sort of improve, fundamentally shift from a blog style approach to tracking data breaches to a data science and database approach. We know that these labels are imperfect, um, but they were based on uh, FTC reports on data breaches at the time um, and a, what we've noticed in the industry. We're continuing to explore how these can be improved. And so, dear viewer, if you have any thoughts about types of organizations that we are missing or breach types that we uh, should be tracking, please do let us know at databreachchronology at privacyrights.org with the subject line, 
suggestion. But these are the labels that we use throughout the, uh, throughout the chronology. Going to the next tab, we have a view by category tab. Now the goal here is to let you drill down into impacts across different sectors and different attack vectors. The idea is that we want you to be able to get insights into how a particular industry or a particular community is impacted in the data breach world. For example, we could look at unintentional disclosures at educational institutions over time, or maybe we wanna look at hacks at medical facilities over time. View breaches uh, sorted by the number of exposed records are, are visible in the, uh, the live updating table here. And if you hover over any of those breaches, you can see that you get more information. But if you want to get really fine grained information about an individual breach, we're going to recommend that you look at the search breaches tab. And we'll go over that in just a moment. We have a view by state view, which is, as predicted, uh, an ability to drill down into individual states and uh, see how data breaches are being reported in your community. What does that tell you about the quality of the data that we have and also the uh, the actual data breach landscape in, in their state? Well, it, it can vary, obviously. Uh, you will notice immediately that states with strong data breach notification statutes have more data and better data about data breaches. It is a shame that for many states, uh, we only get information about them because businesses are required to report breaches in neighboring states or nearby states. And so we get the bleed over from theirs. But this lets you filter by any individual states. And then the surrounding tables are designed to help you gain sort of at a glance insights into what's going on in that country, in that area. You see the breaches over time by type table, live updating in the bottom left-hand corner, a continually updating list of the organizations sorted by the highest number of reported impacted records, and a breakdown of the different organizational types, which type we have are more represented in our chronology. Another thing you'll notice across the board, by the way, is that medical breaches are overrepresented in our data breach chronology. Now, this is because we do actually have a single federal data breach notification standard when it comes to medical breaches and only when it comes to medical breaches. Due to the uh, reporting requirements of uh, HIPAA, uh, the Department of Health and Human Services are required to be notified when a medical institution receives a data breach. And so as a result, we actually have very good data across the entire country about medical breaches. And finally, we have a search breaches view. This is arguably the most powerful view in our data breach chronology and is designed to really give you the entire database at your fingertips. You can search for an individual breach by the name of the business, um, or you can use any of the filter views to toggle down by organization type or breach type. And you can also select a radial option to, to filter them based on whether or not we have an attached PDF link uh, available. Now, the original PDF refers to the, the breach notification letter. Now, this isn't available on every single data breach, but for many, many, many of our breaches, you can actually go in and read the original data breach notification letter that was sent to an individual about that specific breach. Oftentimes, uh, the crucial information about a data breach, how it occurred, the impact of the data breach, what you can do afterwards, are buried in these data breach notification letters. And so even when we have one of those dozen states that shares information publicly about data breaches. The quality of the information shared is extreme, you know, varies considerably across the different states. So if you want to look for, for example, uh, a Home Depot breach, you could type in Home Depot and then actually see all the Home Depot breaches and click more information on any of the individual breaches to get to our final view and individual breaches view. The video uh, looping here on the right uh, shows this functionality, but if you click on, for example, here, North Iowa Area Community College, we can see all the information that we have about this individual breach in a single view. Now, this is extremely useful to uh, get the uh, explanations for where the breach types and the organization type determinations were made, as well as seeing sort of at a glance information about everything we have on the breach, view the, read the description of how the breach occurred, or in this case, you can click the uh, the source link and go to the Iowa Attorney General's website and view the original data breach notification statute. 
Another important thing is that this breach view are shareable. So you can link uh, any individual breach. Uh, you can get a, a, a bespoke hyperlink uh, and share that link with anyone else so that if you see a data breach that's impacted your community and you'd like to raise awareness about it, you can really easily do so by getting a link to exactly that breach. I want to talk a little bit about the methodology for our uh, data collection and our data processing and, and how we get this data and what we're doing with it. I talked a little bit about the difficulty of getting good data about data breaches and the fact that only a dozen or so sources share information publicly. And when those sources share that information, the quality of that information shared is, you know, it has a, a huge degree of variability. You can imagine that uh, staff changes uh, at every single one of these state websites. Um, these state websites change uh, as well with the administrations and the, the interest in, uh, in reporting. So normalizing this massive amount of information has been a monumental challenge. We worked with the Coleman Research Lab to normalize our historical data set, supplementing and expanding on that work though, using sophisticated large language models from OpenAI. We really view this project as an exciting demonstration of a, a sort of AI for good project uh, using uh, newly available and cutting edge technologies to do what was frankly previously impossible for an organization like ours. Um, we want to make clear that uh, the tools that we're using are um, normalizing in the one hand, uh, and then separately, we use uh, uh, these language models to, uh, to supplement our data with, for example, our breach type categorizations and our organization type categorizations. This is also really exciting because it allows us to uh, explore new features and, and uh, new types of analysis and inferences in the future. So how is this chronology useful? What can you actually do with it? I hope that the uh, the demoing of the various views and functionality has, has sparked your interest, uh, but I want to underline that this is supposed to be a community tool. So the goal here is to uh, to get this out into the hands of community leaders who can use this to uh, protect your community. Our data breach chronology contains information currently up till uh, February of 2021. We are in the process of updating it through till today and uh, expect to be able to um, build in functionality such that it is continually updating on an ongoing basis very soon. Uh, but we encourage you to use our breach chronology to identify at-risk areas. Drill down into your community's areas and to figure out which industries and sectors and communities are most likely to face data breaches so that you can use, uh, so that you can focus your education and prevention efforts there. We hope that you can use our chronology to spread the word and share insights from this tool through engaging campaigns and use it to help those impacted. Ultimately, uh, the data breach chronology is a technological tool that is attempting to put a band-aid over, frankly, a regulatory problem. The data breach notification standards uh, is, there are many areas where a, a, a single federal uh, privacy law uh, would be you know, enormously helpful, um, as long as it doesn't preempt uh, stronger state laws. Uh, a federal data breach notification standard is, is precisely one of those areas. Um, and so hopefully, uh, we hope that the data breach chronology can demonstrate not just where we uh, have good data, but highlight where we have poor data as an indication that we should probably be doing this federally. So I want to thank uh, Linda and Linda Williams and Nelson Santiago and everyone at Consumer Action for helping to organize this and for inviting me to talk to you about this project. We are extremely excited about it. It has been an enormous amount of work, much more than we ever expected, uh, and it's taken much longer than we had expected or hoped. Uh, but it is live right now, and we would love for you to go to the tool, uh, use it, make use of it, share it. Um, and if you'd like to download the database, uh, we have the database uh, available for download. You can um, go to the FAQ to find out more information there. There's a storefront page. Um, in order to continue to be able to offer this tool for free and the underlying data for free to journalists, consumer uh, advocates, um, community organizers, uh, we do provide the download uh, option on a sliding scale. Um, so we charge access 
for organizations that can afford to, or at least provide the ability for organizations that can afford to, to support the program. Uh, but if you're a student um, that is doing research into this area, um, please do reach out. We'd love to get you uh, get our data into your hands. And I think that's been it. My uh, my name again is Emery Roan for Privacy Rights Clearinghouse. This has been a, a really fun time talking about the data breach chronology, our brand new tool uh, at Privacy Rights Clearinghouse. Thank you for your time. Thank, uh, thank you, um, uh, Emery, for that uh, great presentation. And before I let you go, I need to tell you I thoroughly enjoyed those tech law policy podcasts that you co-hosted. I learned an awful lot. And it was clear after watching it while you are a sought out speaker globally, which is why we wanted you to hear today. So thank you very much. For that is some um, puffery in the highest level, Linda, and I appreciate it. <laughs> thank you so much for um, educating uh, our audience uh, today. Audience, you. you are only a click away if you're interested in information on scams, ID theft, investing, or how to protect your privacy online while banking or, you know, just living your life. Go to our website at www.consumer-action.org. You can download our ID theft PowerPoint deck and fact sheets on investing getting started on putting, uh, getting your money to work for you, investing for women, investing for communities of color. And you can also download uh, fact sheets on how to stay safe when you are online. In addition, you can sign up for our monthly scam gram newsletter, which will keep you abreast of all of the latest scams out there. And there's one brochure that I believe should be in every home in America, and that, it, that is our how to complain booklet download it and share it with someone that you love today. Now, if you're interested in uh, making a contribution to Consumer Action so we can continue bringing you these um, great recorded sessions, you can do so online by credit card or by PayPal. Just go to www.consumer-action.org slash giving, or you can mail a check to Consumer Action, Attention, Membership, Giving, 57 Post Street, Suite 611, San Francisco, California, 94104. Don't have a check? It's okay. You can continue to support us. You can cons support Consumer Action by subscribing to our YouTube channel. It is free, and it would help us continue to bring you these great uh, recordings and webinars. Uh, if you uh, And if you find out that a company that you are doing business with online are in, uh, in brick and mortar, and you find that they have suffered a data breach, here's a few steps you can take right away. Change your password. Uh, sign up for two-factor identification. Check for, check for updates from the company. Watch your accounts. Check your credit reports or uh, freeze your credit. Thank you for joining us today and a special guest to our guest speaker for bringing us such great information. Thank you and enjoy the rest of your day.